Hi there, and welcome to the Cotswold Explorer. I'm Robin Shuckborough, and we're exploring the wonderful region of the Cotswolds in southwest England. We've decided to revisit the centre of the region and find some hidden gems, places that are not quite so famous, but still just as beautiful. And today, Ross, Widget, Gizmo and I are slightly out of our area in Gloucester Cathedral. This astonishing place we visited for our Easter special and we were determined to come back to see a little more and to talk a bit more about it. We're very much looking forward to this. Come with me. Approaching this wonderful building from the southwest, as we would advise, you get the impression of a church entirely in the perpendicular style. It is, of course, Norman in origin, but the English Gothic style that is known as Perpendicular started in around 1350, and it was around this time that much improvement and extension work started on the building. Gloucester is certainly amongst the earliest examples of this classic style of architecture, which continued to be used in the construction of English churches for more than 200 years. The huge tower, built between 1451 and 1457, rises 225 feet, that's just shy of 69 meters, into the sky. It's crowned with an open parapet and wonderful delicate pinnacles. Its corner buttresses and all its facades are covered in intricate carved stonework. And the crowning pinnacles are each like a small version of an entire church tower. It's a truly astonishing example of the brilliance of 15th century stonemasonry. We highly recommend you visit this place and walk as far as it's possible around the building to get as many views of the tower and nave as possible. Entering the church, there's a distinct change in feeling. Huge pillars supporting the arches of the nave are original Norman piers, cylindrical and solid looking. They are a reminder of the antiquity of this building. They are just short of 10 meters high although their original plinths are hidden by the 18th century stone paved floor. The ceiling, which was built between 1239 and 1242, is considered by some to be a little too low. Pevsner suggests it looks like an elegant, graceful hat, hardly fitting the rugged face underneath. The explanation seems to be that Following a fire, masons began the restoration at one end of the church with incorrect measurements, and it is thought that the monks finished the work themselves without the assistance of the craftsmen they'd bad at the beginning. You just can't get the staff, you know. This cathedral is full of treasures. Time restrictions mean we can't give you a full description of them all, but there are three we really would like to show you. First, the monument to Prince Osric who died in 729, which was erected to him as the founder of the late 7th century Minster. As you can see from Ross's clever high camera angle, he holds the abbey church in his left hand and a scepter in his right. Next to him is the tomb that quite probably is responsible for the fact that this building still exists. There had to be some reason Henry VIII decided to create the See of Gloucester, and the fact that King Edward II was buried here could well have been the reason. His effigy is made of alabaster, one of the very first important examples of memorial alabaster in England. He's portrayed as the typical Plantagenet with a fine bearded head flanked by angels. And he holds the royal orb, which is also the first time on an English royal tomb. The top is a complex array of delicate gables and pinnacles. Edward's son was determined to create a memorial as great as any in Europe, and it truly is an extraordinary piece of work. It is said that he also commissioned a model of a naval ship in solid gold, which was supposed to sit on the little shelf in front of the tomb. Originally, the stonework would have been highly decorated and coloured, possibly even studded with jewels, but even this building, saved from destruction, was not immune from the iconoclasm of the age. The world-famous east window of this cathedral is astonishing. 
It reaches from floor to ceiling and is full of fascinating images. It's possible to see this extraordinary window from many different angles. The cathedral has opened the stairways to the upstairs galleries, where the space is brilliantly used to illustrate medieval building techniques with working models and explanatory notes. When we were there, several school parties were visiting, and it was wonderful to hear the enthusiastic responses of children of all ages. I mentioned that the church's transformation into a cathedral saved it for the time being, and I used the words advisedly. It had a very narrow escape just after the Civil War. During the Commonwealth, its total destruction was once again planned. Indeed, the demolition of the Lady Chapel and the Little Cloister had already begun when a grant secured by the mayor and corporation in 1656 seems to have saved it from this catastrophe. Just showing we really must keep our eye on our heritage and protect it from the apparently ever-present Philistines. Looking at this extraordinary cloister with its magnificent fan vaulted ceiling, one of the earliest and certainly one of the most spectacular in the whole of England, you realize the astonishing skill of the medieval stonemasons. This was conceived in about 1350. It took about 50 years to build, probably built by several different stonemasons over that period of time. It's quite difficult to tell where they begin and end. But it is really difficult to imagine how anybody could ever think of demolishing such a fabulously beautiful place. It was conceived in around 1350, but it took about 50 years to bring to completion. It seems to have been built by several different masons, but overall, this extraordinary place is one of the few works of masonry art that brings tears to the eyes. I think we might return to this place one day to look at it all in more detail, but meanwhile, it gives you an idea of the depth of destruction wrought by the powers of the Reformation and the depth of the losses mankind suffered as a result. Bearing in mind that this kind of thing happened all over Europe, and you do have to ask yourself what it is that so often makes us fail to appreciate the achievements of our forefathers. The Lady Chapel at the east end of the cathedral is the final medieval addition to the cathedral, probably built between 1465 and 1482. It was started under the abbot Richard Hanley and finished by his successor Robert Farley. It's entered beneath the bridge which carries the passage linking the north and south galleries now open to the public to visit the Whispering Gallery. Very exciting trip. The chapel feels quite separate from the rest of the cathedral. It's ornate and some think slightly too fanciful vaulted ceiling and its beautiful windows make this peaceful space, for me at least, a welcome haven. The two small chantry chapels to the north and south, probably built for the two abbots responsible for the building, are well worth looking at, with more fan-vaulted ceilings and stone singing galleries. The windows are extraordinary. The east window is made up of 14th and 15th century fragments, probably assembled as they are now in the early 19th century and the outstanding arts and crafts side windows by Christopher Wall are a wonderful blend of jewel-like colour and drawing of the finest quality. The monuments in the Lady Chapel are great. There's an excellent standing statue of John Powell, who died in 1713, sculpted by Thomas Green of Camberwell. Powell is dressed in the robes of a judge of the Queen's bench a noble figure of white marble against a black background. Next to him is an effigy of Elizabeth Williams, who died in childbirth in 1622. She's leaning on one elbow with her infant on a pillow beside her, a tragic figure reminding us of the fragility of human life in the 17th century. In the North Chantry Chapel lies the Bishop Godfrey Goldsborough, who died in 1604. On his tomb is his effigy, dressed in white surplice and black chimere, with lawn sleeves, scarf, ruff, and a black skull cap. 
The window behind him is late Victorian, probably around 1895, by Charles Kemp. This place is truly astonishing. I do hope you've enjoyed our little film. Come here if you can. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. The bells are starting to ring. Couldn't be more appropriate. You can find us on all the other platforms. We'll see you again in the very near future. Goodbye.